Our favorite movies don't always hold up as well as we'd like them to. Their characters remain trapped in whatever decade in which they were created, so that when we revisit them later, we find that some of the cinematic heroes we loved when we were younger are now just time capsules of horribleness, bulging, sweaty wads of archaic racism and sexism that come screaming back from the fringes of memory to make us feel embarrassed that we ever thought they were cool. Every sports movie you've seen about a gruff new coach coming in to pull together a team of miscreants in time to win the big game comes from Hoosiers, which is a movie about Gene Hackman doing all of those things in 1950s Indiana. The American Film Institute lists Hoosiers as one of the most inspirational movies ever made, and the Indiana Pacers are wearing special jerseys to celebrate its 30th anniversary. And you know what I noticed the last time I watched Hoosiers? This is the team Gene Hackman beats. And why does that matter? Well, because... Despite what a lot of people think, Hoosiers isn't a true story. It was inspired by the 1954 Indiana State Championship season of Milan High School, but the movie takes place in the fictional town of Hickory in 1951, and Milan's coach was in his 20s, unlike Gene Hackman, who has never been in his 20s. Desegregation in public school didn't become the law until 1954. South Bend Central High School, the very real team that Hickory beats in the film, was one of the first integrated high schools in the entire country. Hell, the final game of the movie is played in Indianapolis, and in 1950s Indianapolis, there was exactly one high school that accepted black students. Crispus Attucks High School, the first all-black high school in the city's history. Crispus Attucks, incidentally, was defeated by the real-life Milan High School team during the historic championship season that Hoosiers is based on, but then went on to win back-to-back -back state championships. Kinda sounds like that should've been the f***ing movie. But no, instead we wind up cheering for the team of ass trash who beats them. Now I know it's it didn't seem that way when we were little because school sports are so important to you and also the movie is ostensibly heartwarming, but Hickory is a town full of shitty people. And the team itself is a bunch of entitled teenage athletes who get to do whatever they want because the town treats them like princes of history. And Gene Hackman just becomes one of them. There's a scene where a teacher's pleading with him to leave one of the players alone to pursue an academic scholarship and hopefully not turn into a burned out former athlete who peaked at 17 and spends his days getting drunk in the forest. I don't want this to be the high point of his life. And Hackman actually defends the idea of peaking at 17. You know, most people would kill be treated like a god just for a few moments. This is despite the fact that the only adult characters in the movie are people whose lives have been ruined by basketball. Gene Hackman was kicked out of the NCAA in shame. Norman Dale, coach of the national champions, Ithaca Warriors, was given a lifetime suspension. And Dennis Hopper's a former star athlete now trapped in a haunted Whistler painting. Hey. Later in the film, one of Hackman's players busts his stitches open on the court after slicing his shoulder open when another player threw him into a trophy case. And rather than pulling the kid on the bench or, you know, sending him to the hospital, Gene Hackman starts screaming, patch him up, like Robert Shaw in the full grip of battle insanity at the end of Jaws. And right before they go out to face the South Bend team, whose players have had to fight through years of institutional racism just for the privilege to play high school basketball, two ministers come in to bless Hackman's team. And the second minister says, And David put his hand in the bag and took out a stone and slung it. And it struck the Philistine on the head. And he fell to the ground. Amen. Amen. This is like a movie about the New England Patriots. American Pie is a movie about a bunch of goofballs in comically giant clothing trying to have sex with literally everything. Pie, a flute, a cup of beer, nothing is off limits in this madcap farce. There's even a wacky scene where the gang broadcasts a masturbating foreign exchange student on the internet so everyone in the school can follow along at home and form a daisy chain of masturbation that can probably be seen from space. Here's what never occurred to me when I was a teenager in the halcyon days of the summer of 1999. Nadia, the foreign exchange student in question, has no idea if she was being recorded. She certainly never consented to having a video of her flicking one out streamed across the internet. In the following scene, we find out from our heroes that Nadia's American sponsors were so upset about the video that they put her on a plane back to her home country. She got kicked out of high school and America three weeks before graduation because a couple of chowderheads illegally videotaped her and spread the images across the internet without her knowledge. And they show zero remorse for it. The only reason Jim feels bad is because this means he is now no longer able to have sex with her. Now, keep in mind, this movie came out in 1999. We didn't know the term revenge porn back then. People didn't have smartphones that could be hacked or social media networks across which private photos could be shared. No, American Pie introduced that idea to us. This realization wouldn't sting as much were it not for the earlier scene in which the four main characters make a pact to lose their virginity before graduation. And the kid from Rookie of the Year stands in a chair and says, And by God, we will not stand by and watch history condemn us into celibacy. What Rookie of the Year and Election and Loser and Freddy Got Fingered are all agreeing to is the idea that they are owed sex simply because they exist and they are men. The the idea of being doomed to a life of involuntary celibacy because women will not give them the sex they are owed is the same rallying cry of people who commit mass shootings. Speaking of movies about adults playing children, Superbad is the ballad of Jonah Hill and Michael Sarah trying like hell to get drunk on a Friday night, which is one of those things that becomes so easy when you're an adult that you forget it was ever a challenge. Things take a turn for the hilarious when they're invited to a party, and Jonah Hill makes it his singular mission to get Emma Stone so drunk at said party that 
He can have sex with her. Wow, that one doesn't even need to be unpacked. It's just immediately, obviously terrible, like a racist old Looney Tunes cartoon. It seems weird, but this didn't really stick out as criminally predacious back in 2007. All the trailers make it explicitly clear that Jonah Hill intended to embark on a spirited evening of date rape. You know when you hear a girl saying like, oh, I was so gone last night, I shouldn't have slept with that guy. We could be that mistake. And then we went on to gross $100 million. What's even more insane is the scene where Jonah Hill drunkenly confesses to Emma Stone his plan to date rape her, and her response is her comforting and encouraging him and telling him, ha, ah, come on, you didn't blow it. You big silly bear, you don't need to do all that. Stop all that raping talk. His self-esteem is what everyone is concerned with, not the fact that he spent all day planning a violent felony. <laughs> Dirty Harry invented every gritty cop stereotype we know of. He's the hard-boiled police inspector who shoots first and asks questions later, he doesn't give a fig what any stuffed shirt bureaucrat has to say about it because he knows the streets, and the streets don't follow any kind of rules so neither should he. The last 40 years of cop dramas all owe everything to Dirty Harry. The oft misquoted do you feel lucky scene is one of the most iconic parts of any movie, and it's about a white police officer pointing his gun into the face of an unarmed black suspect in the middle of a busy street in broad daylight. Dirty Harry's the kind of police officer we make hashtags about nowadays. Let's go through the scene real quick. Harry notices the bank is being staked out, but he's clearly not interested in preventing the actual crime because he strolls across the street to a diner and has the hot dog man call the police for him. He just goes back to eating his hot dog. He only gets out of his chair when the alarms go off and it's time to shoot people. You see, that's all Dirty Harry actually cares about. He hates every aspect of enforcing the law, except for the part where he gets to shoot people. That is the worst kind of police officer. In the very next scene after the bank robbery, the fat detective, whom Harry calls Fatso, and I don't remember if they ever actually give the character another name, explains that Harry hates absolutely every non-white type of person alive. Harry hates everybody. And then starts rattling off a litany of racial and ethnic slurs while gleaming with pride. Limeys, mix, heaps, fat dagos, niggers, honkies, chinks. You name it. The main mystery of the film is constantly interrupted for scenes of Harry stopping random street crimes and punishing very specific kinds of people. He shoots a bunch of black guys listening to soul music and sitting in a big flashy sedan. He stops a suicide attempt by basically calling the guy a pussy and then punching him in the face. And then they run a VW bug off the road because screw these. There's a whole scene where Harry calls due process bullshit because it gives murderers more rights than their victims. What about her rights? I mean, she's raped and left in a hole to die. Who speaks for her? But in the end of the movie, when Scorpio hijacks a bus full of kids and Harry jumps on top of it and wrecks it, he makes zero attempt to check on any of the children or the driver. He doesn't even glance inside the bus. He just chases after Scorpio because it's time to shoot people. Even when Scorpio takes another child as a human shield, shooting the bad guy is more important to Dirty Harry than making sure the kid doesn't get obliterated. Then he dramatically throws his badge away at the end because he can't be a part of a law enforcement system that doesn't allow him to just shoot anyone he wants to all the time. This is actually the greatest public service he performs in the entire film. What's up everyone? Thanks for watching my video. Uh, if you liked it, click like, go down and leave a comment. Please subscribe to our channel. And uh, in the comments, let, let us know what, what movies have you gone back and watched you used to love when you're younger and you go back and watch it now, you're like, ew. Like, like you know, like Ace Ventura is kind of like super, it's like weirdly homophobic. Or like The Dark Crystal is just really, it's not problematic really, it's just like really, it's really boring. That can be that can be a thing that we do together.